I'll be talking mostly about uh, the six nations of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois. Uh, the six nations include the Mohawk, the Onondaga, the Oneida, Cayuga, Seneca, uh, and Tuscarora. And the map that I'm showing you here uh, is a map of what these territories looked like around 1650, around uh, the beginning of contact with Europeans. And I've marked this map using the Haudenosaunee names for these territories and uh, many of the large towns in Haudenosaunee territory, just to emphasize that for much of the 17th and 18th century, really up to the eve of the American Revolution, this was an indigenous space. Um, I assume most of you are familiar with what the boundaries of New York State look like now. And that was really uh, shaped by the American Revolution. I'll touch briefly on that towards the end of tonight's talk here. Um, Haudenosaunee people were able to, and many other native nations, but I'm talking mostly about the Haudenosaunee tonight, um, were able to keep control of their territories for much of what we call the colonial period for a variety of reasons that I'm going to talk through tonight. And the major one is related to this image. Um, this is one of my favorite images uh, from the 18th century. This is the only known image of a specifically Haudenosaunee or Iroquois woman. Many of you have probably seen, uh, there's an absolutely like huge number of generic Indian women uh, that are, are depicted in European art in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, most of those don't depict a specific woman. They don't depict a, depict a specific nation. This is the only one that depicts specifically an Iroquois woman before 1800. Uh, and part of the reason that I like this image is, is its specificity and also its directness, that she's looking very much uh, directly at us, the viewer. Um, so a few years ago, when the New York Historical Society was installing a new exhibit uh, related to women's history in the region, they asked me uh, what kind of images I would suggest for depictions of Native women, because it is so difficult to find one that's not just a generic kind of Indian princess image. So I suggested this one. And when the exhibit opened, and it's still open if you go down to NYHS, um, it's a very nice women's history exhibit. Um, when the exhibit opened, I was kind of walking around the gallery uh, and just kind of overhearing conversations walking through. And this image is in the gallery where it's depicted. Um, she's basically life-size. This is a very small watercolor in, in real life, but they have this blown up to basically a life-size image. And it looks great. It's part of a really nice gallery. The interpretive work is wonderful. Uh, and I was kind of creeping around the gallery and overhearing like eavesdropping on other people's conversations um, because that's what you do when you leave historians unsupervised as we we creep on other people's letters and things um and i overheard this conversation between these two women uh and they were talking about this image and like how beautiful her clothing is um how if you wore her striped top with a pair of jeans uh, and her moccasins it would be like really trendy and cute and i agree it's a very, it would be a very cute outfit and then one turned to the other one uh, and she said, you know, I wonder where she got the money to pay for all of the ribbons and beads. And the second woman kind of thought about that for a minute. And she said, well, they must have sold all of their land for it. And I think that's a really... I share this story not to uh, not to slam against the New York Historical Society and not to like make fun of these museum visitors, uh, because the New York Historical Society has very nice interpretive work. Uh, and I, I tell this story because I think that this conversation really encapsulates several decades of academic scholarship. Like that's why these women like have these ideas and have this conversation. And the ideas that I think it encapsulates is that the idea that indigenous culture is inherently replaceable, indigenous nationhood is inherently replaceable, that somehow participation in commercial culture and buying things is inherently damaging specifically to native cultures, and that women's purchases especially are frivolous, unknowing, and damaging that people are selling away land for a handful of beads. That's a very familiar story. Uh, and much of my talk tonight, I'm going to argue that the way that we interpret this image matters very much, and it matters the way that you interpret uh, what she's wearing here. 
So what she's wearing, she's got probably a linen jacket or bed gown, kind of ruffled at the edges there. She's wearing uh, a wool blanket trimmed with silk ribbon, uh, a wool skirt trimmed with silk ribbon and probably silver uh, brooches down along the bottom there. And then also uh, wool leggings with some silk ribbon and silver uh, brooches again. And then the strap that you can see over her forehead here and the thing on her back, that's actually a baby in a cradle board. Um, she's got uh, the, the little baby in the cradle board is also, the cradle board is also made of wool um, and probably decorated with either silk ribbon or glass beads. And all of that means that it is very easy to interpret this image as evidence of colonialism as evidence of replacement of this woman's traditional Mohawk culture with European trade items. Uh, because basically everything that she's wearing here, everything that the baby is wearing here, at one point probably passed through a European trader's hands. Um, even the moccasins, uh, there was a huge trade in the 18th century of native people in the West in the Great Lakes making moccasins, deer hide moccasins for sale East to Eastern native groups uh, like the Haudenosaunee. So a lot of the items that she um, that she's wearing here are very likely to have passed through your, uh, uh, the hands of a European trader at some point. But I would argue to you that the source of your clothing does not determine your culture or your nationhood. Um, I would guess that many of you who voted yesterday um, did not put on like your traditional American tricorn hat uh, as part of you know, the traditional act of American voting. You probably wore what you wore every day. Much of what I'm wearing right now was made in places like Vietnam or Laos or Thailand or uh, other places outside of the United States. And that's because it was made for the American market and it was made for people who are secure in their nationhood, that we are not making an argument about our nationhood through our clothing. In large part, clothing is an argument that people make about themselves. In situations uh, like dealing with women's history, especially, or native history, or the intersection of those two things, where people often didn't leave a lot of their own records uh, for historians to look at, that means that clothing is especially valuable as a record of what were the stories that people were telling about themselves. We have an absolutely huge amount of writing by uh, by other people writing about native people in the 17th and 18th century, but we have relatively little of native people writing about themselves. So what can clothing tell us about how people, what the stories people told about themselves? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a little bit under the weather, so I apologize if my voice is a little rough. Um, so I'm going to start with the stories uh, that Europeans told about Native people, just to give us some context for the stories that Native people told about themselves in a bit. I'll return to that image we were just looking at. Uh, these are two of the first images of Haudenosaunee or Iroquois men that we have, uh, made in about 1700. And there's quite a lot of writing and depictions of the Haudenosaunee and other Native people as naked Indians. There's a lot of concern among Europeans in the early seven, uh, 16th and 17th centuries about this nakedness of Indians. And this is coming from a lot of sources. Uh, one of these sources is that clothing and specifically European style clothing is seen in the 17th and 18th centuries as a necessary prerequisite to Christianity. Europeans are very, very invested in converting the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee specifically because they're they're basically the most mil uh, powerful military presence on the North American continent. Uh, and as such, converting them to Christianity, getting them to wear European style clothes was seen as an absolute military and political necessity. It was a large part of uh, basically all diplomatic efforts from the French, the Dutch, and the English until well past the American Revolution. And I'll talk about what that looks like in the American period uh, towards the end of my talk here. And this emphasis on nakedness comes out of a particular emphasis on what nakedness means in a religious context. There's not a concern about nude Indians and anybody who's lived in New York for any period of time during this time of year or later in the winter especially, knows that you are not naked in New York uh, in the middle of winter. Native people are not literally naked or nude. Nude is the term that uh, Europeans use in this period for like actually without clothing. 
Nakedness was much more about uh, ideas about poverty and specifically distance from God. So the idea was that nakedness was more about the spiritual nakedness than the actual nudity of the body, uh, although we do see uh, quite a bit more skin on display here uh, than, than Europeans might have. So this is the reason that Europeans spend a considerable amount of effort uh, trying specifically to change Haudenosaunee clothing over the course of the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, they do this through missionary efforts. They do this through sending traders. They do this through attempting to set up schools. Um, it's a very long and very sustained effort aimed specifically at the Haudenosaunee. And this effort comes to focus specifically on Haudenosaunee women because both for Europeans and for many indigenous groups, women are the ones who make and buy most of the clothing. So that means that all of these debates, concerns, tensions around who's wearing what and how came to focus on what kind of work were women doing and therefore how also to change it. So if clothing is part of the story that people tell about themselves, it's also very much part of the story that they tell about other people. Uh, we saw that in the context of the naked Indians with the previous slide. And this is the Haudenosaunee side of that story. Um, these are deer antler combs. These are literally like you use these to comb out your hair uh, that were found in a variety of uh, garbage heaps at Haudenosaunee town sites from the 17th century. Uh, and I really like these because they're some of the few depictions that we have made by native people of European people. Uh, these are relatively rare, like across North America. Uh, and as you can see, they all depict Dutch people. This is in the Dutch pe period of uh, New York. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and one of the things that uh, clothing in particular tells us about how people think about themselves and their and others is how they draw distinctions between themselves and others. Uh, one of the Haudenosaunee words for Dutch people specifically was button people. And you can see that very much in a lot of these combs, that there's an emphasis on the buttons on the men's coats, the breeches, uh, like the big breeches in the lower right one, uh, and also hats. And these become, for the Haudenosaunee, really emblematic of European clothing. Like, if if somebody is European, they have a hat, breeches, and often buttons. Like that's what it means to be European. And that conversely also means that those are items that the Haudenosaunee are not interested in. Those are not indigenous items. Those are not part of things uh, that Haudenosaunee people adopt because they are so symbolically European. So over the course of the 17th century, <laughs> excuse me, I'm sorry about uh, coughing if anybody's, um, getting that loud. So over the course of the 17th century, um, as the white population increases, Dutch settlement increases, very early on, beginning in about 1630 and in increasing amounts as the 17th century goes on, uh, at Haudenosaunee town sites, again in those garbage dumps or garbage uh, piles, we see a lot of these. And what these are is these are about the size of a quarter uh, in real life. Uh, and this is a two-sided kind of disc that's clamped onto the end of a piece of fabric, like a bolt of fabric that you would buy at like a Joanne fabric store right now, that size. And it was clamped onto the end of fabric after it was done being woven and dyed and everything in Europe to show that the taxes had been paid on it in Europe. And these do not show up in either settler towns in the North American colonies or really often in European towns. They show up in very specific places in European towns because what they show is the presence of that really huge bolt of cloth, like 25 to 30 yards or sometimes more. And the reason they don't show up in colonial settler towns or often in European towns is people bought cloth the way that you would buy cloth at a fabric store now. You went to a store or a merchant, you had your piece cut off of like however many yards you wanted, uh, or you buy clothing from a tailor or whoever. And you're not buying the piece that has the tax stamp on it. So these tax stamps were usually in Europe taken, melted down, uh, and reused, the, the lead reused. So they don't show up often there. 
where they do show up often is specifically in Haudenosaunee towns. So that suggests that these absolutely massive bolts of 25 to 30 yards of fabric or more are showing up themselves as an entire bolt in these towns. And from descriptive records also, we have a sense of like, there's a really radical change in Haudenosaunee clothing around this period, around 1630, 1640. Um, Dutch descriptions of European, uh, excuse me, of Haudenosaunee clothing stops describing them as wearing turkey feather mantles, uh, leather, deer skin, things like that, and starts describing them as wearing wool. Uh, and these are from wool production centers in both England and, and, uh, and the Netherlands. So it suggests that there's something pretty radical that happens around 1630, 1640. Uh, and from what I have been able to piece together from uh, traders' prices, what I think has happened uh, in that early 17th century period is there's a huge drop in cloth prices. Dutch prices for cloth for trade to native people very early in the 17th century and like 1614 when uh, Fort Orange is first established are quite high. Uh, and there's a lot of native complaints about that specifically. But in the 1640s, it falls really dramatically from what uh, direct evidence of cloth prices we have. And there's this huge flip all of a sudden of these tax stamps start showing up in garbage heaps and descriptions of native people wearing just wool cloth across the board uh, appear. So something happened uh, and native people's clothing changed really radically in this, in this region. And what that did for, uh, for Europeans was it very much fueled the hope for conversion because Europeans are looking at this and they see native people adopting large amounts of cloth. In some cases, European style clothing like linen shirts, uh, men, some native men sometimes wore European style coats uh, in addition to a mixture of native items like leggings and breech clouts. And they hoped that this was the first step uh, towards conversion to Christianity. And this hope very much remained uh, part of European thought well into the 18th century. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is from the account book or store register of Jealous Fonda, who is uh, coincidentally Peter, Jane, and Henry Fonda's ancestor. Uh, and Jealous Fonda was a trader uh, just west of what's now Albany. Uh, and he kept this ledger of accounts that he had with both native people and white people that's very revealing. So Fonda lived uh, near to Fort Hunter, which was established earlier in the 18th century. And um, it was a fairly evenly mixed white and Mohawk settlement. Uh, the population numbers from so far as we can tell were about even. Uh, in some cases, families, Mohawk families and white families lived literally across the street from each other or within sight distance of each other in this settlement. So very, very close neighbors uh, for much of the 18th century. So Fonda's account book shows us the records of people who were literally neighbors. They attended church together. He has some records of people um, working for each other uh, on each other's farms. For instance, a German settler would plow a native man's field. A native man would help build a fence for a German neighbor, things like that. So people who lived very close lives together. And what we see in Fonda's account book, as well as other account books, is a lot of detail about what people were buying and not buying. And this is part of the story that people tell about themselves through what they do buy and what they don't buy. So Fonda's native customers, these are kind of like um, itemized credit card receipts. Like you can see exactly what somebody bought. So here, um, Sawistawa is a Seneca woman who's visiting. She bought a blanket, she bought some garters uh, or gartering. She bought a shirt, a blanket, uh, and she has a small belt of wampum in pound uh, in, in pawn for, uh, for credit. So you get a fairly detailed sense of what people are buying. <coughs> Excuse me. And the white customers that Fonda had were buying things very consistent with what we see in a lot of large towns like Philadelphia, New York City, Albany. They're buying items that they're using to make kind of tailored men's coats, um, tailored women's uh, gowns and things like that. A lot of structuring items. 
Native people that bought from Fonda bought many of the same items, the same kind of cloth, the same kind of clothing. They would buy shirts and things like that. But they did not buy buttons, linings, or buckram stiffening. So things that would be used to structure a, like a structured tailored man's coat. And they're also not buying thread for the most part. So vid, like the objects themselves, the cloth and some of the objects like uh, shirts are mostly the same, but the absence of some of those tailoring items strongly suggests that Fonda's customers going to the same church, living a, across the street, doing work together, are making very deliberate choices about what not to wear. That they are very much not wearing the kinds of hats, coats, breeches that we saw in those uh, depiction of Dutch men in the combs. What they did wear was often items specifically made for the Indian trade that white customers did not buy. So things like the moccasins coming out of the Great Lakes made by other native people and then bought and resold by Fonda. Um, or items like the leggings that we saw on the woman. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so there's a, a large and uh, very growing trade in what's called Indian leggings um, that places like the Albany Poor House would have um, widows, uh, would give cloth to widows in 18th century Albany and have them sew those leggings specifically for the Indian trade for sale to, to traders like Jealous Fonda. Uh, as a form of support. So instead of having a widow go into the poor house, have her uh, manufacture these leggings for the Indian trade. And white people were not buying these. So this combination of things shows us that even in a, a settlement like Fort Hunter, where people have very, very intimately intertwined lives, they are making choices to visually distinguish themselves. And this is not only about visual clothing distinctions. Um, this is a digital analysis of the church congregation at Fort Hunter, where uh, Jealous Fonda himself attended. What this is, um, is if you have the baptism of a child, and you have the two birth parents and the two godparents, and you draw a line between all of those adults, and you keep doing that and keep doing that and keep doing that, you eventually get something like this. Uh, with all these lines between a dot is an individual person, and then the lines are connections between those people. And Fort Hunter looks really weird. Um, I've done this for about 90 church congregations across all of early North America at this point. This is the only one that looks like this, uh, because this is also the only one that has a population of equal white people in blue and native people in red. And the hinge point in the middle there is two women. The large blue dot is uh, a woman named <laughs> named Anna Peak, and the smaller uh, the smaller red dots off to the right there are a woman named Kanastase and her husband. And Anna Peak sold cloth. She was also accused of uh, selling liquor like a fountain for, uh, by one uh, also cloth and liquor trader who wanted to drive her out of the business. Um, and she was a midwife, which is also likely why she uh, was, Anna Peak was such a hinge point in this congregation. And one of the things that we can see from this, this, and this is Fonda's customers. These are the people who are buying from Fonda and buying in very distinctly separate patterns, is that socially people were also very distinctly separate. So clothing is not all, only a story that people tell about themselves, it's also a reflection of their social lives. And that social separation was extremely important because of the emphasis that uh, British, uh, British people especially, but Europeans in general, placed on the idea that cloth and clothing was a prerequisite to Christianity. Because these are Mohawks who were Christian. This is an Anglican church. These are Mohawks who are buying cloth and clothing from Jealous Fonda at much the same rate as their white neighbors. And yet, they didn't look the same. So this woman on the left is the woman that we looked at before. Uh, and this, the woman on the right is, <coughs> uh, is an, image from a, of a, an image of a woman in the Netherlands, but it's likely similar to what would be worn uh, in the Mohawk and Hudson Valleys here in the 18th century. And they're not that different in some ways. 
Uh, there's kind of the light colored upper clothing, uh, the jacket or the bed gown. There's the blue lower clothing. It's a little bit shorter. It doesn't go all the way to the ground um, because both of these women are involved in domestic or agricultural work. Um, they're both covered about the same amount. The Dutch woman has her elbows out. <laughs> they're likely wearing a combination of very similar fabrics, linens, calicos, wools. And yet you would not mistake one of these women for the other. You wouldn't mistake the Mohawk woman uh, as being assimilated or having uh, had her culture replaced by Dutch culture or German or, or English culture because of her visual distinction of her clothing. Uh, and the argument I would make to you tonight is that that was a very deliberate choice on the part of native communities. Because of this more than two centuries of pressure to convert to Christianity, to uh, change modes of clothing, for women to change the kinds of clothing that they bought, then the kinds of clothing that they made, they were very aware of what their white neighbors wore. And they were very aware of what missionary uh, uh, Christian missionaries and mission schools wanted them to change to. Uh, and especially once we get into the American Revolution period, there's a lot of very specific pushback uh, from Native communities to that. During the, just, uh, just before the American Revolution, when there was a, a Presbyterian proposal to establish a school in Mohawk territory, <laughs> um, one of the Mohawk uh, chiefs who was a, a speaker for the women, a speaker for the women is in this official position within Haudenosaunee governance um, that spoke on behalf of the Council of Clan Mothers. And the speaker for the women specifically rejected a school that would teach girls sewing, in addition to other things like animal husbandry, livestock raising, uh, and, and European style agriculture. And he's he specifically rejected it uh, using very pointed language about um, ideas about English hierarchies of race, because that he said that if the Haudenosaunee or the Mohawk were to allow this school, they would be bent down low like Negroes among the Dutch. That for the Haudenosaunee, this idea of this school that was supposed to change their gender roles to look more like the English gender roles, would specifically bring them into the system of racial hierarchy that they had seen develop among the Dutch and the English. So they're very much aware of kind of the place that uh, the English want native people to occupy in this racial hierarchy and how it's connected to Christianity and how it's connected to clothing. <laughs> So on the eve of the American Revolution, that mattered very much. Um, I'm not going to go very deeply into the American Revolution, but I'm gonna, just going to kind of skate past it very briefly, um, because this all changes really radically with the revolution. And part of what changes it is specific attacks on women, Haudenosaunee women, as part of their community's governance. Um, what we see during the revolution is very pointed attacks, uh, both diplomatically and militarily, that are aimed at pushing women out of the decision-making process, uh, attacking them physically during the American Revolution uh, in raids during uh, what's called the Sullivan Campaign. And it results in this. This is uh, the same view of what's now New York and uh, Lower Canada <laughs> that we looked at earlier. Uh, and this is what it, that territory becomes by 1840. Uh, the, the kind of gray colored areas here are, are what remained of Haudenosaunee territories. And then the dark gray is Haudenosaunee reservation territories today. So it's very much greatly restricted. Uh, the American Revolution precipitates really a huge land loss for Haudenosaunee and other native communities. Part of this comes out of uh, specific post-war attacks on uh, American attacks on Haudenosaunee uh, alliance with the British. In the early uh, terms for negotiating peace with the Haudenosaunee, Washington, as one of his first presidential acts, said that the Haudenosaunee should be made to discover some sign of repentance. And this is what that repentance looked like, uh, very significant and precipitous land loss. And what this was used to do during the 18th century, or excuse me, during the 19th century, uh, was enforce a policy of assimilation. Uh, beginning in the 1820s and 1830s, this was called the civilizing mission. This is part of the same push 
uh, that resulted eventually in the push of the Cherokee uh, out into Oklahoma. <laughs> and what this civilizing mission was successful at doing was what two centuries of mission work, schools, and uh, traders had not been successful at, which was radically changing Haudenosaunee gender roles and modes of dress. This is a, an image painted by a, a, a pupil at the Quaker Mission School at Tunisasa, one of the early reservations. Uh, and most of these early reservation schools, these are predecessors to the Carlisle style of boarding schools. These students went home to their families every night. They were not boarding school students. But these schools were the forerunners of that style of education because it very much focused on changing gender roles and changing the style of clothing uh, that Haudenosaunee families were expected to wear. Um, so girls were taught sewing of the style of, of dress that the teacher is shown wearing there, but it still persisted in some places. Uh, the push was to change the way that women worked and what they were making, uh, but it, it still persisted. And the places that it persisted are particularly significant. These girls are wearing kind of a mix of European uh, and older styles of clothing. But by 1840 or so, most Haudenosaunee people, most of the time, uh, were wearing clothing pretty visually similar to what white people in, in their areas were wearing, similar to what the white woman on the side there, the teacher, is wearing. But where it persisted, and I'm sorry, uh, ending on this, the book, my uh, editor told me to do this, uh, where it persisted was in regalia for ceremonial religious events, uh, and in the New York State Museum collection. Uh, the woman on my, the cover of my book uh, in about 1848 made the outfit that she's wearing in this image here. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, and she made this on commission from the New York State Mu uh, Museum as an example of the oldest and most ancient style of Iroquois dress. And what she's wearing is very similar to what that woman in the first slide that I showed you was. She's wearing a red calico overdress, uh, a ruffled lace collar, it's embroidered with beads and with silver brooches, and she's wearing um, a, a blue wool blanket over it. And part of the argument that this ensemble that she's wearing makes is that commercial culture and this style of dress is the ancient and most traditional style of the Iroquois. That sovereignty and nationhood for the Haudenosaunee in this period where the civilizing mission from the federal government and the New York state government was pushing so hard to destroy them as nations was part of a much longer two century story of commercial culture uh, and nationhood. So these things are very, very much tied together. The stories that people tell about themselves and the stories that they tell about their nations. Um, so my book is Shirts Powdered Red, Haudenosaunee, Gender, Trade, and Exchange. Um, my publisher gave me a 30% discount code there if you decide to buy a print copy, but it's also available uh, to read free online. So if you pull up the links for my slides uh, that I think Elizabeth put into the chat, the first link goes to the kind of book description page. You can read more about it. And then the second link that says free to read online uh, goes to where you can actually read the book yourself, um, but separate from buying a print copy. Uh, and these are just a couple of links that may be of interest. Um, Seven Dancers Coalition and Rematriation Magazine are two organizations here in the kind of broader New York, Canada region <laughs> that specifically do uh, revitalization and advocacy work for Haudenosaunee Young Women's Arts Organizations or, or Arts Work. Um, so Rematriation Magazine in particular puts out some articles that may be of interest if you came to tonight's talk. Uh, the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center is an advocacy organization for uh, Indigenous women uh, broadly, and some of you may be already be aware of Historic Anandigan, uh, which is a site operated, it's the only uh, historic site in New York State operated by um, uh, one of the Haudenosaunee nations, and it's a very nice historic site. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Great, thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, I'm going to give people a couple minutes. If you would, we're going to open this up to Q and A. So if you'd like to ask any questions, please type them into the chat. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask um, to to get the conversation started a bit. Um, can you tell us um, about your favorite type of source material to use when you were you were doing this project? 
Um, I really like the account books. Um, there's very few account books from, there's a couple more from the 18th century. There's very few from the 17th century. Um, account books are really interesting as a source because a, they can be really weird and hard to work with in a way that I find interesting. So Jealous Fonda uh, grew up speaking Dutch. He also spoke German, French, and English, and his English is not great. Um, so a lot of times 